It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. So much, Speaker. Speaker, in every corner of this province, people are watching with dread as COVID-19 surges back. And once again, the province scrambles to react. On July 14th, nearly 70 days ago, the Premier declared that he had a detailed plan to deal with a likely second wave. In fact, he said, and I quote, I just got off a call with our health team and some of the best medical minds in the entire country, and that will be rolling out very shortly. Over the next little while, we are prepared. 70 days ago, that's what he said. Why did the Premier claim he had a detailed plan and then fail to produce one? Huh. <laughs> Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, Thank the uh, leader very much for the, uh, the official opposition for the question. We are prepared. We have had a plan prepared since July 30th. This was a long time ago. Of course, we are ready to roll it out imminently. It is dealing with all of the issues that uh, uh, people are concerned about, dealing with testing, dealing with lab volumes, making sure that we can continue with the policies and the uh, procedures and surgeries that had to be postponed during wave one, dealing with the upcoming flu season, and making sure that we have the health human resources to be able to deal with a surge in cases, both in our hospitals, in our long-term care homes, as well as in home and community care. There is a plan, it is ready to go, and it is going to be released immediately. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, parents, Missing a day of work to stand in line with children for eight hours to get tested, or learning this week that their child's school is yet the latest one to be in an outbreak. Don't need a government that promises a plan. They need a government that has a plan. <laughs> the Premier claimed that he was ready with a plan months ago. The minister's claiming that there's a plan that was ready months ago. So why then does the government claim that they would be rolling out this plan back in July, and yet to this very moment, we have yet to see a plan? While kids are going to school and outbreaks are happening, and while parents are waiting literally hours and hours and sometimes days on end in lines for testing. Minister Thank you. Health. There is a plan, a complete, comprehensive plan dealing with all of the issues that we need to face for a potential wave two of COVID-19. It is ready to go, and as a matter of fact, it is being implemented as we speak. One of the issues that has arisen is the need for further testing. We are doing further testing. As I indicated uh, last week, we are prepared to move up to 50,000 tests within the next week or so if we need to. On Saturday, we reached 40,000 tests in one day. That is a record for Ontario. We are moving forward. We have increased. We exceeded our capacity at 25,000 tests. We are now at 40,000, and we will be very shortly at 50,000 tests. But uh, with respect to the issue that the member has raised concerning the long lineups and testing, I can speak to the fact that we have significantly increased our capacity in a number of areas. I will deal with the East Region because I have heard a lot about Response. Ottawa. We have increased significantly. I will speak further about that in my supplementary. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, when parents have to line up with sick children for hours and hours on end just at a chance to get a test result, something is absolutely not working. On July 7th, in a response to an NDP question, the Minister of Health admitted that we would need much more testing come the fall and promised, promised that as part of that second wave, their detailed second wave plan for the fall, that testing would be increased by 50 or up to rather 50,000 tests a day. And we're not there yet. So there's something wrong with the minister's claims and the premier's claims that they made back in July. If the government had a detailed plan, Speaker, why are parents waiting and waiting and waiting in eight our lineups with their kids and sometimes still not getting the tests they need. Response from Mr. Health. Well, the plan is substantive, it is comprehensive, it is actually being rolled out, witnessed by the fact that we reached 40,000 tests on Saturday. We are well on our way to getting to 50,000 tests and we're going to increase from there. 
But with respect to the issue of the lineups, we have increased significantly. We are planning a new location for Kempville. If throughout the region, we have additional paramedic crews for surge testing and assessment. The Brewer Park Arena, which serves both CHEO and the Ottawa Hospital, it's a new location and increased capacity, 30 plus 33 per cent by October 1st, plus 63 per cent by October 31st. Amont General Hospital has increased capacity hours and is up by 140 per cent. We anticipate that we will have a 133 per cent increase in testing by September 30th and a 60 per cent increase planned for the whole region very shortly thereafter. So the Response. plan is there. The plan is working. We are getting to the testing that we need and we are shortening the lineups. Here, here, here. Thank you very much. Next question. Again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, it's September 21st, and I hope the Minister realizes that the plan should have been in place and acted upon already. But, Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier. You know, thousands of people with loved ones in long-term care were told this spring that, uh, that they uh, were going to have no uh, expense spared to protect their loved ones. This was a promise that the Premier made uh, back in the spring. No money would be spared to protect people in long-term care. Today, the Globe and Mail reports that for three months, the government has refused to act on recommendations from senior uh, experts in infectious disease in order to build what we need in terms of prevention and infection control in our long-term care homes. Question. My question to the Premier is, can the Premier explain why he has not acted on the recommendations of his own experts? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for that question. I want to assure all Ontarians that action is being taken. It is actually, we have a, a situation in Ottawa where three homes, two particularly, of concern. And I want to make sure that Ontarians understand that 99.7% of our homes are managing very well with COVID-19. So our attention is focused in an integrated effort uh, with the Ottawa Hospital, in, uh, the, the Medical Officer of Health in Ottawa, taking every measure possible and making sure that the dollars flow, the $243 million that was set aside uh, and allocated for improved staffing, surge capacity, infection and prevention control. We've taken regulatory amendments, three packages of those, four emergency orders, and our IPAC specialists going in April Response. 15th is we had an action plan ready to go, and I, I can start to list uh, the uh, homes and the hospital partnerships. I'd be happy to clarify this misunderstanding. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, there can be no doubt whatsoever that we are definitely in the midst of a second wave, and once again, long-term care homes are largely unprotected. Three months, uh, rather three more residents, you'll know I spoke about this last week, three more residents have died at West End Villa in Ottawa just over this past weekend. That brings the number to 11 deaths in that facility. 61 residents now have COVID-19 in that facility. Facilities across the province are scrambling, scrambling to find enough staff. You know, experts have been clear on the need for infection control within long-term care and a plan to deal with the dangerous, dangerous lack of staffing that has existed for a very long time in long-term care. So why are seniors in long-term care speakers still waiting, still waiting for the government to act, act on recommendations that were made three months ago, three months ago, by their own experts on long-term care? Thank you. Mr. Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Actions are being taken, and they have been taken all along. Our IPAC program, part of our action plan uh, from April, are absolutely clear and, and proof that our homes are getting infection prevention and control efforts and getting the expertise from the local hospitals. I have said many times here in this chamber 
This is an integrated response between hospitals, uh, medical officers of health, Public Health Ontario, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Ontario Health, the Ministry of Long-Term Care, the Ministry of Health. And so for a few examples, I can tell you that the homes are getting support. And over the last few months, Downsview and Humber River Hospital have been partnered, River Glen Home and South Lake, Forest Heights and Mary's Hospital, Woodbridge, Vista and William Osler, Altamont and Scarborough Health Network, Response. Eatonville, Unity Health, Extendicare, Guildwood, Orchard Villa, Lakeridge, Villa Colombo, Humber River Hospital, Hawthorne Place, North York General, the Ottawa Hospital, and our, our homes in Ottawa. So I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the final supplementary. Speaker, with all due respect, hospitals are scrambling to take care of, uh, of procedures and surgeries that were cancelled during the first wave. They are concerned about the flu uh, that's coming forward soon. This minister seems to not realize that hospitals are not going to be there to save the day like they were last time because they have so much on their plate right now with a broken hospital system that existed before. But over 1,850 people have lost their lives to COVID-19 in long-term care during this pandemic thus far. This wasn't inevitable by any means, Speaker. It was the result of a long, broken long-term care system. The Premier has talked about fixing that system, but spent the summer campaigning instead of preparing and implementing a plan that his own health experts, his own infectious controls experts, have provided him back in uh, three months ago. And at what point then, Speaker, at what point will this Premier actually understand Question. that families desperately need a government that doesn't wait for disaster to hit? but they actually start planning for that disaster before it hits. Thank you. Again, the Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again for the question. The plan is ongoing. We are continuing to be adaptable and vigilant. There is ongoing surveillance in our long-term care homes. We are increasing the layers of protection for our homes, whether it is a mandatory management order or a volunteer management agreement, or whether it's getting infection and prevention and control or making sure that our staff in long-term care have N95s and access to those, making sure that, that our, our communications and the uh, that the homes have proper communication with family members, getting our caregivers back into the homes. But I remind you, only three homes out of 626 long-term care homes in Ontario have more than three cases. And in two of those three, we are actively engaged. That's 99.7% of long-term care homes in Ontario are managing very, very well. The homes that Response. are not, we are making sure every, every bit of effort, every time that we have is focused on those homes. It is an integrated effort, and we will continue to fight COVID. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Over the weekend, we learned of three more tragic deaths at West End Villa, a long-term care home in Ottawa, operated by Extended Care a for-profit corporation. Workers at the homes are coming forward telling us that they could not and cannot access proper personal protective equipment. The Premier has been told over and over that overworked staff in long-term care homes were not able to access the equipment they needed to protect themselves and their residents. And he promised that it would never happen again. Why is it that the staff at this long-term care home are still coming forward telling us that they are not able to access the personal protective equipment that they need to stay safe. Mr. Long -term care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again uh, for that question. And my heart goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one. And I can assure this chamber and Ontarians that West End Villa has the PPE that it requires, including N95s, available to the staff to use. We are absolutely uh, 24 hours a day helping this home, making sure that it Order. has staffing. The public, public Health Ontario, our Medical Officer of Health, I've been in constant contact over the weekend and for weeks, making sure that this home has the support that it needs. And I'm going to mention again 
uh, the comment that I made here in this chamber last week that what is happening in our long-term care homes in terms of the spread of COVID and COVID getting into our homes is a reflection of what's happening in the community. Ottawa is struggling Once. to keep its numbers down. Our medical officer of health is doing everything possible. We will continue to have an integrated approach and long-term care will stay our focus and we will fight COVID in those homes. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. When the cameras were on, the Premier talked about the changes that are needed in our long-term care home. But once the cameras were off, he seems to listen to the well-connected Conservative lobbyists working for a corporation like Extendicare. Meanwhile, Order. staff are left Order. scrambling, overworked, underpaid, and without the PPE they needed to stay safe. On Friday, the Premier told, told us, he said, I wanted long-term care operator to take responsibility. But what about the Premier taking his responsibility? When will the Premier take any responsibility at all for the fact that, first, workers still cannot access proper protective equipment, and second, seniors or loved ones are still dying of COVID in our long-term care homes. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. We need to deal with the facts, and the fact is that our long-term care homes in Ontario are receiving the PPE they need. They have the PPE they require, including N95s. I have been absolutely clear on this over the weekend, making sure that that is the case. Despite the politics Order. done by the opposition, Order. I want to deal with the facts. And the facts are that our long-term care homes have the PPE that they need. Most of them have a weak supply, and we are making sure that that is absolutely accurate. I have been on this. I know what is true. And despite the politicking that is going on in this chamber, I will continue to tell the Stop the clock. I'm going to ask the Premier to withdraw his unparliamentary remark. Who, me? Yeah, okay. I withdraw. I don't know what I'm withdrawing, but I'm withdrawing. So the procedure for withdrawal is to stand in your place and withdraw without qualifications. I'm going to ask the Premier again to withdraw without qualifications. Thank you. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, Ms. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier. My riding of Mississauga Malton in Peel region have been one of the hot spots during COVID-19. Earlier this summer, we unfortunately saw one of the reasons why. While Peel was in stage two and had strict requirements of private gathering limits on individual, felt the need to host a 200-person house party. Images captured on social media showed something out of a movie with rows and rows of packed cars and individual crowds. This was reckless, dangerous, selfish by this person to the health and the safety and the sacrifice and endured for months by my constituents and all individuals who have displayed discipline in stopping the spread, unfortunately. Since that time, we have seen and heard the most stories like this from many young individuals across this province. Premier, with 425 cases reported Question. today, highest since June 6, what is our government doing to ensure that the wild house parties like this we have seen are stopped? and those who think they are above the law. Thank you very much. The Premier to reply. I want to I thank the uh, member from Mississauga Malton for doing such a great job, and yeah. I appreciate what they're doing. <laughs> I hear an echo, Mr. Speaker, but I guess they, they get away with it. As I stated previously, when individuals are reckless. And there's a small group. There's always a small group of bad apples out there that want to ignore the health and safety of the people in Peel and right across this province by recklessly holding these 
backyard barbecues, and I'm, I'm not talking about 10 or 12 or 13 people, Mr. Speaker. I'm talking 100 and 150 people out there hooting and hollering and having a great old time. That, that's fine. I'm not against having a great old time. What I'm against is when they're having a great old time, not socially distancing, not masking, and uh, not, not uh, following the guidelines from the chief medical officer. What we've done, we've introduced amendments to Response. the Reopening Ontario Act to set a minimum fine at $10,000 for any organizer that's holding these parties and anyone that attends a $750 fine, Mr. Speaker, and hopefully that will re uh, deter the party goers. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplementary question is also to the Premier. Premier, I want to echo your statement as well. We need everyone to be pulling in the same direction. And thank you for your leadership during these tough times. Any increase or surge in a case number means that more resources are required in the hospital, put our seniors and most vulnerable at risk and hurts our businesses and everyone who have sacrificed so much during this time. This re represents real impact to everyone involved and those we care deeply. Since the stricter enforcement measures were put in place. Brampton alone in, have seen 59 individuals receive summons for fines up to 100,000, and the city has issued over 700 tickets for the inf infractions related to COVID violations. Just this past Saturday, Hamilton and GTA police officers had to take time in a coordinated effort to shut down a 500-person important car show that had been organized. Speaker. Question. Can the Premier please share the legislature further information about what these measures will mean for our fight against COVID-19. Thank you. The Premier. Well, again, thank, thank the member uh, from Malton. Yeah, and I agree with him, Mr. Speaker. The uh, vast majority of everyone is pushing in the same direction. You have a couple bad apples that, that don't want to follow the rules. Uh, some other people want to play politics instead of uh, supporting, Order. but that, that's here and there, Mr. Speaker. This targeted action is a direct response to the latest data, which we've seen, that tells us that increased cases are a result of private and social gatherings, large social gatherings. And the, the new limits don't apply. They don't apply to law-abiding, responsible restaurant owners, banquet halls, uh, any other uh, organizations or, or companies that follow the guidelines. I think we've all went in to support a restaurant, and the guidelines are incredible. They're following the guidelines, following the protocols. Th this is what we need the rest of the, the public to do. Stop the massive social gatherings, as we saw in Ancaster, and uh, I'll be addressing that at my press conference. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Um, my question is to the Premier. According to the Peel District School Board's website, as of today, there are a total 30 reported infections at public schools across the region, and those numbers are increasing daily, Speaker. All of us, parents, educators, and students, tried to go into the new school year hoping for the best. The government knew that kids were going back to class in September, but the reality is that they were unprepared for this return to the classroom. Peel Region and the City of Brampton Brampton simply do not have the dedicated resources they need from the province to fight this crisis and to prevent the crisis that's unfolding in our classrooms. Every day, Speaker, I receive calls and I know people across the province are receiving calls from students and parents who are upset and confused by this government's broken back-to-school plan. In, in our community, they're waiting hours in, in line for tests. Question. Why is the Premier and this government so unprepared to manage the crisis in our classrooms? Minister of Education. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Over the weekend, I joined Dr. Yaffe, where I facilitated calls with the directors of education, the chairs of education, and the local health authority. We spoke with uh, Dr. Lowe, Dr. Uh, Mao, as well from the, as the Associate Medical Officers of Health in Peel, likewise the directors of the public and, and uh, Catholic school boards and chairs. The message was one of unanimity, that we are working together to reduce the risk of transmission in our community, which by extension can and will enter our schools. What we've heard from the Chief Medical Officers in Peel was a message that the system of outbreak is working, our outbreak protocol is working. If I could listen to other medical officers across the province, Dr. Charles Gardner of Simcoe Muskoka Medical Officer of Health said, and I quote, I think the outbreak protocol plan is well crafted, for example, Speaker. Uh, Dr. Kurji of Ottawa says, uh, the issues of returning our schools is something we could all agree is uh, unanimous. Uh, and extended uh, uh, support for outbreak management protocol. We put the resources in Response. place, the training in place, and we will continue to do everything we possibly can, including growing our testing capacity to respond to the risk within our communities. And this supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker. Um, we all want our kids to be able to go back to school, but this is simply not happening. Parents also thought that they had options, Speaker. If they didn't feel safe enough to send their children to school, they had the option to enroll them online. In Peel, we saw numbers of 10,000-plus students enrolling online, and now what we're hearing is that those students are waiting until late November in order to access virtual learning options. Because of this government's backlog and lack of resources, people are waiting too long to access education in our communities. The opposition has been asking the Premier and this government for weeks, and yet there is still no plan in place. Reducing social gatherings, but still cramming 30-plus students into our classrooms is not the answer to stop the second wave. Why won't this Premier cap class sizes so that 15 students are what is limited inside of our schools? Thank you. Again, the Minister of Education reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, it was this government that stood very strongly in support of online learning. Uh, it was our party that stood alone in the defence of having an online learning option through the negotiations. We continue to believe that that capacity is a strength. In this province, we have virtual schools schools being developed. We have allocated $30 million to hire principals for those schools to create accountability. And we've set a very high standard. 75% of each and every day of those 300 minutes of instruction must be live, synchronous, Zoom-style learning. And I hope that all members will agree now, upon reflection when they oppose this in the spring, that that standard meets the needs of our kids who deserve nothing but the best. The continuity of learning is important. In Renfrew, where we saw a school most regrettably closed because of outbreak, in that school, within 24 hours, speaker, they pivoted immediately to online learning. And we are grateful to that board. We expect that right across this province, Speaker. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the government's response to the first wave of COVID-19 in long-term care can best be described as flat-footed, and we're now into the second wave. At Ottawa's West End Villa, they're experiencing the biggest outbreak since the first wave. 52 residents, 26 staff, have COVID-19. 11 residents have died. And families, staff, and home operators across this province are all begging for the government's help. Donna Duncan of the Ontario Long-Term Care Association has been calling for the government's Wave 2 plan, action plan since July and described the situation as terrifying. Geriatrician Dr. Nathan Stahl from Women's College Hospital calls it very scary. We said we would never let this happen again. Speaker, through you, can the Premier explain why Ontario's long-term care homes are so unprepared for the second wave? I recognize the Minister of Long-Term Care to reply on behalf of the government. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. 99.7 percent of our long-term care homes in Ontario are managing very well. There are three homes that have more than three cases in the Ottawa area. It is public, public knowledge that Ottawa, Toronto, and Peel have larger numbers of COVID-positive cases. Our efforts are on supporting the homes in Ottawa in conjunction with the Medical Officer of Health in Ottawa, with Ontario Health, with Public Health Ontario, taking the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. This is an evolving um, science and evolution of understanding of this virus, and we continue to consult our experts, to consult, consult with our stakeholders Response. and the sector to understand what more we can do. We have acted all the way through the first wave, and we will continue to take action through this pending second wave. We will continue to act. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I don't know how we find ourselves here. There is no plan for a second wave in long-term care. No plan to address chronic staff shortages. Those who helped during the first wave and from hospitals and schools, well, they're not available. And a month ago, pandemic pay ended, so PSW wages went down, not up. And the government's not even listening to their own infection dis disease experts calling for better prevention and control measures. Dr. Jeff Powis, medical director of infection prevention and control at Michael Guerin Hospital, said we should have been doing this work well before now. The Premier promised an iron ring. That's quite an image. Sadly, that image hasn't appeared. Just empty hollow words. Speaker, through you to the Premier, how is it we find ourselves unprepared yet again to protect our most vulnerable from COVID-19? Thank you. 
Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, clearly, you've, you've uh, highlighted staffing, and our government, Ministry of Long-Term Care, has been working on the staffing issue ever since we became a ministry. We have an expert panel that provided a report, which we are acting on, and in the process of acting on that, working in conjunction with the Ministry of Health and, and other ministries to make sure that we address the issues uh, as much as possible that are recommended in that report. Uh, in terms of the IPAC, that has been going on uh, since a real heavy focus since the middle of April on that, understanding how COVID spreads, whether it's through surveillance, active screening, enhanced testing, uh, improved IPAC, and relationships across the sector with hospitals to provide the expertise. This continues. We will continue to take Response. every measure possible. And I remind you that 99.7% of our long-term care homes are managing very well. Our focus right now is on the homes that are in difficulties. We will continue to take every measure and take additional measures as needed. And I want to make sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Speaker, the vast majority of Willowdalers and Ontarians have done the right thing to stop the spread of COVID-19 by staying at home, working from home. Of course, Mr. Speaker, that means a lot more time at home, uh, cooking meals, lunch from home, uh, leisure time at home with family, and that means that they're using more energy, hydro at home, Mr. Speaker. Through you. Minister, can you tell us what our government is doing to support those individuals who continue to do the right thing to stop the spread of COVID-19? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Willowdale for his work and his representation in his constituency. Mr. Speaker, indeed, as a father of two young children at home for almost 70 days, there were a lot more, a lot more laundry to do. Dishwasher was running more frequently. We knew, Mr. Speaker, that millions of people across the province were at home. They were at home working. Small businesses were p facing challenges with their revenue streams, but still had commitments to uh, have their lights uh, on, Mr. Speaker. Similarly, farmers were preparing for a season. So 70 days later, Mr. Speaker, after the heart and soul of the uh, most profound shutdown, Ontario had provided more than $175 million worth of relief to families, small businesses and farmers, Mr. Speaker, by providing them with the off-peak rate and then moving Response. to a fixed rate to provide certainty, Mr. Speaker, as we, move, as we moved forward and continue to provide certainty and value for the price of electricity, Mr. Speaker, for our homes, families and small businesses. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the minister highlights uh, some very important points in his response. Uh, you know, the people of Willowdale have told me how difficult this pandemic has been on, on not just their, their work life, but their home life as well. And, 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 and men, many people don't have that choice, Mr. Speaker, of, of shifting their consumption to off-peak hours, like doing their laundry late at night, or, or Mrs. Park at Drury Convenience, who, who she can't shut down her store uh, in the middle of the day when time of use rates were mandatory, Mr. Speaker. Uh, through you, Minister, can you please tell the House what you're doing for Ontarians who've been negatively impacted by the time of use program in the past? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In, in, indeed, this had been a challenge uh, prior to COVID, and so we took swift action, Mr. Speaker, to understand that there were indeed uh, families that would struggle paying their bills through COVID. That's why we put $9 million into a program for them, more than $8 million support program for small businesses, Mr. Speaker. And when it came to time of use, obviously, Mr. Speaker, we needed to focus on a rate that was competitive and fair for families that were still going to be home. In fact, there are many as we speak. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business uh, said that they welcomed uh, the leadership of the Premier um, for bringing a an end to time of use electricity pricing for small business owners as of November 1st this year. Mr. Speaker, we'll be rolling out a comprehensive energy plan that the province can actually look forward to, Mr. Speaker. And I look forward to providing industrial A class and B class, Mr. Speaker, Response? employers who will put people back to work in this province as part of our uh, COVID recovery response for fair, certain prices, Mr. Speaker, that provide great value for the people of Ontario. Thank you very much. The next question, the member from Meskigawak, James Bay. Merci, bonjour, Monsieur le Président. My question is for the Minister Mac of Health. Minister, as of last night, there was 10 COVID-19 active cases in Northern First Nations. There are six in Casabonica Lake, one in Sandy Lake, one in Piginchicum, 
and two in Moose Factory Island. Speaker, as Ontario enters a second wave, this series of cases in remote First Nations is beyond alarming. With the housing crisis, chronic problems with clean water, drinking water, enduring illness affecting remote First Nations, this government should have, been, should have acted proactively. Instead, it remains passive, only reacting to reality. Speaker, why has this government continued to drag its feet and fail to preempt this situation that risks of spreading like wildfire in remote First Nations in Ontario. Minister Health. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member very much for the question. I know this is a matter of serious concern to you, uh, as it is for us as well. This is something that we have worked throughout this pandemic with members of First Nations communities, with the federal government, with the provincial government, working in a tripartite manner to try and protect and contain any outbreaks in the uh, First Nations communities, because we know they are particularly vulnerable for a number of reasons. But I can assure the people of Ontario and the member that this is something that we are working on right now through Dr. Dirk Heyer with the outbreak management team to make sure, first of all, that they have the supplies that they need in order to provide people with the equipment they need. We're doing testing. We're doing um, uh, isolation where in the situations where that's possible and moving people around to hospitals and other Response. locations. But this is something that we do take very seriously and have been working on this throughout, particularly now. And a supplementary question. Speaker, back in March, the Minister of Health deemed James Bay Area as low risk for dealing with COVID-19. This means that the Conservative government had put one of the most vulnerable population in their province at the bottom of the list. So they had to wait for over three months to receive critical equipment, like ventilators, to prepare for today and today's what is today a reality. And as Muskegwa Grand Chief, Chief Solomon mentioned this week, the tests coming from James Bay are taken to laboratories in Timmins, process, processing that in three, uh, 300 kilometers south of Moose Factory Island. Results have taken four days to reach back to James, to James Bay, which has delayed contact tracing. Speaker, is the minister satisfied with this four-day waiting time? Question. And why has she failed to provide rapid testing to First Nations as it was promised months ago? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I would say uh, through you, Speaker, to the member that we have always considered all of our Indigenous communities to be uh, subject to uh, particular vulnerability with respect to COVID-19. That has always been the situation, and we have always worked throughout, including regular engagements with the Minister of, Minis of Indigenous Affairs, as well as with myself, having close contact with members of the communities to make sure that they have the supplies, to make sure that the testing is being done, to make sure that they are protected, because we knew that this was a community that could be susceptible to COVID-19. That has continued throughout, and we have worked with the federal government as well to make sure that they are doing their part as well. But I would also indicate that we have spent money. We uh, know that we need to provide additional services. We've provided $37 million to these communities in the face of COVID-19. includes $16.4 million to help with the distribution of goods, transportation Response. support for urban Indigenous people, self-isolation, prevention awareness, and pandemic planning. We have also spent $10 million to ensure continuity of services, $7.4 million to ensure that social service providers have the Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Member for Orléans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Ottawa's chief medical officer has declared that our city is in a second wave of COVID-19. Case counts that we haven't seen for months and a testing strategy so flawed that people stand in line for hours before the centres open. A line one kilometre long on Moody Drive last week, Mr. Speaker. 11 new tragic deaths at the West End Villa long-term care facility. And now an elementary school, the first in the province, is going to be closed for two weeks because of extensive COVID-19 exposure. The government is sitting on billions in federal COVID-19 assistance, and they've promised for months that they have a fall second wave plan. Fall begins tomorrow. The second wave is here. Where is the plan? 
Minister of Health. Uh, well, thank you. I thank the member very much for the question. We have already taken action with respect to some of the long lineups in Ottawa, as I indicated earlier, that we have increased capacity uh, by extending the hours of a number of the assessment centres. There are 41 assessment centres in the entire East region. Uh, total daily average visits 5,100 people. We've already taken action by having those assessment centres expand their hours of service, and we also have some mobile testing services that are available in pop-up centres in those areas where the greatest lineups are occurring. We're also looking at bringing others on. We are looking at expanding capacity by having other organizations provide service. That is being taken care of. With respect to the advent of a second wave, we have prepared for a second wave. We have a plan that is about to be released. It's going to be released Response. immediately, but that doesn't mean we're not already implementing parts of the plan. We will be discussing that with the members of the public, but the plan is being implemented as we speak. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my supplementary is also for the minister. Uh, if the government has a plan for a second wave of COVID-19, how does the premier roll into Ottawa last week and immediately contradict the chief medical officer of health on who needs a COVID-19 test? They don't have a plan to improve physical distancing in schools. We know this for a fact because they voted against it last week. The iron ring around long-term care has crumbled. And despite what we've heard earlier from the Minister of Long-Term Care, I want to quote an employee at the West End Villa. Workers are going from room to room, working with these residents, caring for them, and they do not have the proper N95 masks to use. The Financial Accountability Officer has confirmed that the government has only contributed three cents on the dollar for COVID-19 supports, yet there remains billions in federal dollars available to the government uh, in their accounts, Mr. Speaker. We've known that a fall second wave is coming. Question. Where is the plan, and why won't they show it to Ontarians? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, as I indicated earlier, there is a plan. It is being implemented, and it is going to be released immediately. But it does address all of the issues that you have referred to. Our government is putting hundreds of millions of dollars into protecting Ontarians' health and well-being. And we have been in discussions with the federal government with respect to the monies that are available to us for expanding our testing and lab facilities, for contact tracing, and for mental health facilities. All of these options are, are being developed. They are ready to go. They are in our plan. They are being Order. brought forward. We have already substantially increased our testing capacity, which was at 25,000. We're now at easily 35,000 and close to 40,000. We will be at 50,000 available tests in a very short order. So we are fulfilling our plan. We are increasing Response. our testing and our lab capacity. We are ready for the fall and everything else that will bring with it, including the flu, and making sure we can continue with the surgeries and procedures that were postponed. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the President of the Treasury Board. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, government and businesses in Ontario have had to adapt by using digital tools and technology. We all had to adapt our work routines, for example, using Zoom or StreamYard to, con to conduct meetings or town halls. Business owners in my riding are telling me that purchases are increasingly being done online. Uh, business meetings are conducted through video chat, and e-signatures have replaced pen and ink. Many of these changes have proven to improve the quality and speed of doing business. The government and the public service, as well, has had to change with the times. We have seen over the past several months the use of virtual doctor's visits, online court tools, and several products rolled out by the Ontario Digital Service. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the President of the Treasury Board. Could the Honourable Member inform this House about the recent work of the Ontario Digital Services? President of the Treasury Board to reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the fine member from Mississauga Centre, including her work as a registered nurse on the front line. Hey, hey, the hey. You know, I'm very proud of the work of the Ontario Digital Service, which is now part of the Treasury Board, and they're working along, uh, over the last couple of months. They are digital experts, they are data scientists, and they are working to make things simpler and faster and better to help protect uh, Ontarians and all health uh, and safety for everyone. Mr. Speaker, just last week, the Minister of Education 
uh, through the Ontario, Ontario Digital Services work, created a screening tool to allow parents and students to check on, on the website to find out whether they should be coming to school or not. Mr. Speaker, if some of the others had actually done that screening, they might not have gone to school. Here, here. So, Mr. Speaker, we are embracing technology for the lives Response. of Ontarians and the health and safety for Ontarians, and we'll continue to do that on behalf of all Ontarians. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the President for his answer. Uh, it's great to hear about the work of the Ontario Digital Service. I understand that the Ontario Digital Service worked with the Canadian Digital Service to develop and, and launch the free COVID alert app. The app notifies users who may have been exposed to someone who tested positive for COVID-19, and by doing so, supports early detection, testing, and self-isolation. This Made in Ontario tool is a growing success, with Newfoundland and Labrador, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick actively supporting the use of it with more provinces to come. It's great to see that more than 2.6 million people have downloaded the COVID Alert app. Can the President of the Treasury Board tell the House more about this new innovative digital tool? Again, the President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, for the question. And I just checked, and uh, I've got a green thumb on my app. I'm oh, not sure good. if I'm allowed to do that, but I just did. Uh, and, uh, You're not, <laughs> <laughs> but you can conclude your answer. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for that intervention. Um, Mr. Speaker, though, I will say, without using any material, that the app is working. Here, here. Uh, more than uh, 2.6 million people have downloaded the app, and I'm very pleased to say that Saskatchewan and uh, Nova, uh, New Brunswick have just joined the uh, family of uh, COVID alert apps across this country that started in Ontario and made an Ontario app. Mr. Speaker, in fact, last week or a few weeks ago, the uh, CTV reported that earlier this summer, an individual was notified through the app that they were exposed to COVID-19. That individual Response. and their friend both got tested and both were positive for COVID-19. Let's all do our part. I encourage all Ontarians, members of this House, to do all their part to protect others, protect yourselves, and protect Ontario. Download the COVID uh, app today. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, on Labor Day, one day before the start of school, Sudbury families learned that 25 school bus routes have been cancelled. You can only imagine how angry and upset students and parents in Sudbury were when they found out the day before school started. When reached by the Sudbury Star, the Executive Director of the Sudbury Student Services had this to say, Speaker. For some drivers, when they found out that the return would be regular capacity on our school buses, with only children from grade 4 to 12 needing to mask, they decide not to come back. Speaker, if the conservative back-to-school plan is so amazing, why are so many school bus drivers deciding not to come back to the profession that they love? To respond, Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. In the province of Ontario, for many, many years, we have faced, and class this country has faced, a shortage of drivers uh, within our schools. This has been a real challenge that the former government, this government, faces. What well, we have done to help counter that trend, given that many of these workers are older, and of course, I can appreciate their own considerations and their own health in the context of being in, uh, returning to work. Uh, we have provided the extension of the driver retention program, a $40 million allocation, essentially a wage enhancement to incentivize these workers to stay. We provided a full suite of PPE, the complete offering of PPE, including face shields and masks. We provided more latitude for cleaning. In fact, we've mandated it, Order. a higher standard of cleaning within our buses. We're doing everything we can, working with the Ontario School Bus Drivers Association to ensure that our school bus drivers are there for moms and dads in this province, that ultimately kids can get to class safely each and every day. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The government, in fact, is providing everything but limiting the amount of kids on schools. Speaker, during the first week of school, 25 routes cancelled in Sudbury. Last week, parents found out that 19 bus routes were cancelled. I checked two days ago on Saturday, no routes were cancelled. I checked again this morning, 15 school bus routes were cancelled in Sudbury. Imagine the uncertainty for Sudbury families. The root cause of this, Speaker, is school bus drivers don't trust the Conservatives' flawed back-to-school plan. They simply don't, no matter what the minister says. Speaker, the majority of our bus drivers are either vulnerable seniors or parents with preschool-aged children. They want to work. They absolutely want to work, but they can't risk their health or the health of their families. Bus drivers and parents want to know why COVID-19 best practices like social distancing 
are enforced everywhere but on the school buses that transport our children. Speaker, will the Question. Premier commit today to capping school buses at 50 per cent capacity? That could be the everything that you've done, 50 per cent capacity to protect, better protect students and drivers while preventing the spread of COVID-19. Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, we have provided school boards with an additional $75 million in support for transportation, recognizing the difficulty this year especially, but a difficulty that has existed in this country for all provinces and really for all parents for all over a decade. What we have done, Speaker, as I affirmed, is provided route protection funding to, to the extent possible for school boards that deliver buses and bus transportation uh, to parents, that they have more funding to help backstop them. We've also provided an extension of the driver retention program to help retain these workers within our school. Order. We provided Member for Davenport, come to order. PP and training for these workers, and we continue to be there for them. It's why just a few weeks ago, the Premier and I announced an additional investment for school bus cleaning. Speaker, we have ensured all layers of prevention are in place. We've also ensured assigned seating within our buses from a contact management process so that that could be the integrity of that process is retained when and if these Response. challenges arise. In every area, we follow the public health advice. We'll continue to be there for parents, for school boards, and, of course, for the children of our province. Great. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Um, my question is to the uh, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, as the province continues to safely and gradually reopen, our government is committed to encouraging economic growth and job creation in the forest sector. Sustainable growth, Ontario's forest sector strategy, couldn't come at a better time. It is our government's plan to create jobs supporting the Indigenous uh, northern and rural communities that depend on the sector while ensuring the province's forests are managed sustainably for generations to come. All around the world, people are looking to industries and products that are sustainable. Uh, my question to the Minister, Speaker, is how sustainable are Ontario Ontario's forest management practices. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forests. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the uh, member for Perth Wellington from Perth Wellington for that uh, good, great question. And what a better time to talk about forestry than the, during the 100th anniversary of Forest Week here across Canada. Stewardship and sustainability is the number one pillar of our new forest sector strategy, which people have been waiting for for years in the province of Ontario, a province where so many people, so many communities depend on this bedrock industry, one that, was one that was one of the ones that established this province. And here in Ontario, here's our pitch. If you harvest trees, you replant trees. For every tree that we harvest, three are planted, three take oh. root. We have 71 million hectares of forest in the province of Ontario, of which 28 million hectares are crown managed. And you know what we harvest? Less than one half of 1% of that crown managed forest Response. each and every year. Under our program, the way that we consider sustainability uh, a bedrock principle, we will have forestry to supply, pro provide those jobs for generations to come. Here, here. And the supplementary question. I want to thank the minister for that response. It's great to hear how sustainable our forestry practices are, but we are all wondering these days about our job prospects. COVID-19 has been challenging for us all, and we in this government are focused on a recovery that puts our health and safety right on par with job creation. Ontario's forest industry is critical to the provincial economy and many communities, generating over $18 billion in revenue and supporting approximately 147,000 direct and indirect jobs in regions with few other industries. Our province is home to an abundance of renewable natural resources, but we know that it can be difficult to get them to market, as many are found in the northernmost parts of the province. Speaker, what specific actions has, has our government taken to make it easier Question. for forestry to grow and thrive? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thanks again to, uh, to the member for that question. And you know, the United Nations has predicted that demand for forestry products will grow by 30 percent between now and the year 2030. And I think through this COVID crisis, we've seen how important our forest industry is. The, you know, try to get some lumber oh, these days because it. it's in short supply. And it. we're going to make sure that Ontario can sustainably harvest more timber than it used to. It's only been harvesting about half of what it did only 20 years ago. Yet we 
plant 73 million trees a year in Ontario and drop 365 million seeds to ensure regeneration. Our forests are sustainable. 147,000 direct and indirect jobs in the province of Ontario. Products now that we could replace so many single-use plastics because of modernization in our, in our forestry industry. Good times ahead in forestry. Here, here. Our forest sector strategy supports that. I want the people of Ontario to know that forestry in Ontario is a great business, great today, great for we the future. Know it now. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Recently, I received an email from a constituent. After exhibiting symptoms, he visited Carling Heights Testing Centre in London in hopes of getting tested. He arrived at 10.45 a.m. He was there till 3 p.m. when he finally got to the preliminary testing, when he was told they would take three hours to get tested. He had to go to work, so he left without getting tested. He couldn't afford to miss work. A six-hour wait time to get tested is unreasonable. Both testing centres in London have routinely been over capacity and one is closed on the weekend. Will the government commit to adequately funding the resource and resourcing public health units to decrease the wait times at testing centres? Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. We are certainly aware that there are parts of Ontario where there are long lineups for assessments, but we are taking steps immediately to reduce those lineups because we want everybody who feels that they have symptoms that may have been exposed to somebody with COVID-19 can get a test and have a timely response to it. That applies both to students who are returning to school now or to colleges and universities or people who are returning to work. Right now, there are 36 assessment centres in Western Ontario that are uh, total daily average number of visits, 5,600, but we are increasing both the hours for these assessment centres to be open so that they can deal with and, and test more people without having to wait in a long lineup. And we're also opening new centres and pop-up centres to allow for people to be able to have a test in a more timely manner. Just with some specifics, there is a new location planned for the Norfolk General Hospital as of September 21st. Northern Bruce Peninsula increase of... Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. With people across the province going back to work and kids going back to school, the increased demand for testing was inevitable. The government had months to fully prepare for the second wave. People feel like this government is throwing away all the hard work Ontarians have done these past six months to keep the spread of COVID low. With rising case counts and longer than ever lineups for testing, the anxiety in London is growing. What is the government doing to protect the people of London? Mr. Health again. Thank you. Well, first, Speaker, let me say to the member, through you, that the health and well-being of all Ontarians is our top priority, always has been since the, uh, this pandemic first struck us. We are taking every step that we can to make sure that they are protected. We are increasing our resources to make sure that we can in increase our testing, our lab capacity, so that once the tests are taken, that they can process quickly, to be prepared for upcoming flu season, to make sure that we can have the health human resources that we need, both in hospitals, long-term care homes, and home and community care. We are doing all of that. We have a plan. The plan is going to be released immediately. We are spending more money. We have spent hundreds of millions of dollars to increase this capacity. We have increased the number of tests to 40,000. We are well on our way to 50,000 tests. We are going to make sure Response? that we protect people across the province and including, as the member suggested, in Western Ontario, but it will be across the entire province. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, I have heard time and time again from parents in my writing how concerned they are with the decline in math education that they're seeing in their children's schools over the last several years. Kids are struggling with basic math concepts, and their parents, well, their parents are at their wits' end. 
They know how important math is for their children, and they know that their children are falling behind their international counterparts when it comes to mathematical scores in ways that are both substantial and very worrisome. Can the minister please share some details of how we are preparing our children to get the math skills that they need to succeed and why it is so very important that we tackle this problem immediately? Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from uh, Scarborough Centre. Uh, I want to thank the member from Scarborough Centre for her leadership and also for her insight as an educator and as a parent uh, here in, in Toronto. Uh, speaker, as we respond to this pandemic, I think we cannot lose sight of what we are here to do in the Ministry of Education. Yes, to keep kids safe, but to ensure quality learning continues. That is our obligation. And when 48 per cent, over half the po student population of grade six are not meeting the provincial math standard in this province at a time where we see massive economic disruption to the labour market and more fierce competition for good paying jobs. We have to do more and step it up when it comes to math performance and really embracing that area of STEM education. It's why this government announced a four-year math strategy, $200 million, focusing on the foundations of math and numeracy skills are going to give our kids a leg up and a competitive advantage Response. in the labour market. Our focus, Speaker, is, providing, is improving performance. It's about solving everyday problems and increasing employability in the labour market. We're going to continue to focus on raising the standard of math in our province. That's your question. I'm so pleased to hear that our government is taking math education so seriously. After years of liberal mismanagement, our government is doing what is right. We are prioritizing math education. Speaker, part of our math strategy is to ensure that educators have fundamental knowledge of the math and core Order. math skills that are embedded within our provincial curricular documents. Can the minister tell me why this is so very important to our children and to the parents of Ontario? Mr. Education. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, obviously, it was this government that introduced a new elementary math curriculum from grade one to eight. We did that knowing, Speaker, that this September, more than ever, our kids need to have a heightened level of education and a more modern education. Given in 2005, Speaker, we had two different expectations in English and French, two different curriculums. We had a curriculum that did not focus on coding at all. This curriculum embeds it and codifies it all the way down to grade one in coding. In financial literacy, we've strengthened that, giving so the fundamental math skills, bring that down to grade one, learning skills like a household budget. These are vital when it comes to enabling our kids to succeed. And obviously, enhancing problem solving, mental math. This is the back to basics commitment we made in the election that we're following through. Our commitment speakers to raise the bar of educators for investing in professional Response. development and raising the bar of our students by giving them every uh, opportunity to learn math in this province using a modern curriculum. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. I understand the member for Toronto St. Paul's has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a very, very happy one. Um, as we know, of course, the arts have been uh, saving our mental souls during this difficult time, and I just wanted to take a chance and uh, say congratulations to Schitt's Creek, uh, our, our Made in Canada comedy show that won seven, seven Emmy Awards in the comedy category, a first uh, in Emmy's history. So uh, congratulations to the cast and crew of Schitt's Creek. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Long-Term Care concerning a second wave of COVID-19 in long-term care homes. This matter will be debated Tuesday at 6 p.m. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.